This has forced the self-appointed President Lukashenko to pursue a foreign policy unilaterally oriented towards Russia, which has paved the way for Belarus to become a springboard for the Russian war against Ukraine. A consequence of the war is a clear deterioration and crisis in the relations between Belarus and the EU, Belarus and Ukraine, consequences which are not only bilateral, but also regional in the relations with Poland and Lithuania. Notwithstanding the mass popular uprising in 2020, Lukashenko's regime has proven unbending in the face of popular demand for political change. Boosted by support from Russia, all, uh, Lukashenko has declared himself the winner of 2020. The, le the legitimacy of his office is contested both nationally and internationally. So only with the support of Russia, and that is also important to discuss what is actually the role of Russia and why is it that we're asking the question, does Belarus really exist? Lukashenko considers himself the head of all parts of the government, including parliament, which always supports his policies and already initiates, initiates legislation and, uh, and, and rarely initiates legislation on his own. The regime's governance model is based on what Lukashenko calls the vertical of power, which is a power composed of representatives from the various bodies of power and thus belonging to the various power structures, which at the same time is the most important economic and social elevator for them. Authorities are waging battle against the Belarus national and linguistic identity. The government removes busts and memorial plagues in honor of cultural and political figures, such as the freedom fighter Kastus Kalinovsky and the poet Larisa Hiena Jews. Yeah. Performances, exhibitions, national holidays, and film screenings are also subject to censorship. Belarus has primarily pursued a dual vector foreign policy hither though, with a overall pro-Russian character. But this has been balanced against the EU when it has been opportune. But now it's totally different. Now it's only a foreign policy which is towards Russia. Uh, so what we'll talk to about today is how Belarus as a sovereign still exists or whether Lukashenko is de facto playing the role of a Russian occupying power. And for this, we have a fantastic panel. We have Carlos Bukowski, director of the Latvian Institute of International Affairs and co-host co of this event today. Uh, Tatiana Astrovskaya, PhD and postdoctor in digital history from Herder Institute for Historische Ostmittel for uh, Europa Forschung, uh, and um, in, in looking into the cultural roots of political opposition in Russia, in Belarus, and uh, writing uh, the article, Will the World Save Us? We have Pavel Tereshkovic, the PhD in History, coordinator of Belarusian Association of Education and Science, and he will talk about Belarus language, identity, the state, and farewell to illusions. We have Sergei Masol, PhD in economics, coordinator of the project Corporate Governance in Belarus, Belarus against this post-Soviet empire and dictatorship. Was there a better scenario for us after 2020? And then we have Elisabeth Visgunova Vikmane, PhD candidate at the Latvian Institute of International Affairs who will talk about the Wagner rebellion that wasn't, a view from Riga on Lukashenko's PR victory. And then at least, uh, not the last, but, uh, but uh, and not the least, Rosa Tura Bekova, PhD in history, independent political expert, and will look and can China replace the EU as the second pillar in Belarusian foreign policy after 2020. So welcome to this conference. Uh, within the remits of the Belarus Research Network for the European Neighbourhood. And the, just to say a few sort of um, who established the Belarus Research Network. It's established with funding from the Nordic Council of Ministers. It's managed by the Latvian Institute for International Affairs in cooperation with the organisation called Belladania, the European University of Humanities and the Danish Foreign Policy Society. 
And um, then I would really, again, like to extend my gratitude to Copenhagen University Cross-Cultural and Regional Studies uh, for cooperation on this conference. So welcome to you all, and I'll pass on the word to Carlis. Thank you. I think, yeah. yeah. No. Oh, yeah, yeah now yeah, it's working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, Carlos Bukowskis, I am the director <coughs> of Latin Institute of National Affairs. And Charlotte, thank you very much for wonderful, for wonderful introductions and, and, and moderation. Um, I'm going to be very, very short. Uh, well, in my uh, opening keynote uh, speech, uh, I'm basically going to say a few thank yous, uh, which are the most important ones. So, uh, does Belarus exist today? Well, from a legal perspective, and we, with Elizabeth, we spent uh, a few hours at the uh, uh, legal faculty right next door, and we were wondering about it. And uh, from the legal perspective, of course, yeah, well, it does exist. But does it from political perspective? And that's the, that's the most important um, topic, and that's the most important question that we should be answering today. Because, of course, the Belarus that we used to know for uh, more than three decades, or also, of course, always changing, now has changed dramatically over the past, past three years. Uh, in domestic policies and foreign policies, they have uh, the traditional balancing of a small country seems to be becoming more and more of a bandwagoning with the neighboring big country. So the regime, Lukashenko's regime, has been sanctioned, of course, and because of the violent crackdowns of opposition and also because of the siding with, de facto siding with, uh, with, with, with Russia in its war against Ukraine. And, um, well, also, of course, a lot of reasons why Belarus has become somewhat a pariah in the international community and also in the, in the region, just here in the Baltic region. Um, using living humans as an instrument of hybrid warfare, um, sending them over to borders with Poland and, and, and Lithuania and Latvia, that probably was one of the final breaking points in the understanding of what the Belarusian regime brings about it. Of course, the, the violence against own population, against opposition, is, is of course uh, unimaginable in the first place, but of course using, importing people in order to send them uh, um, to other countries or make them live in the forest somewhere uh, for, for, for months and for years, that actually shows the draconical uh, understanding of the foreign policy that is there. So it has always been the question throughout this, uh, uh, this, this, this research and over the past three years, but especially st um, since, since the last year, whether Lukashenko's regime has been trading off more and more sovereignty to Moscow. And can we actually consider it as a still fully, fully functioning independent, uh, independent country. And uh, we have wonderful experts on the project who have been trying to answer these questions over the past several, several months. And so that is the question. The Belarus that we used to know, is it still there? And what, what will it be tomorrow? And um, so the thank you part, I said I'm going to be short. I'm already getting a bit too long. Um, Belarus Research Network for uh, Neighborhood Policy that we established. Uh, there's been this is a somewhat a closing event, but uh, I would say it's a closing of a chapter, not of the whole book, because um, the project is going to have a continuation. Uh, there is new financing coming in, so starting mid-November until. November 2024, we're going to have a continuation of this project and there's going to be more research uh, coming and more researchers uh, hopefully uh, joining, joining, joining the network. And so far, this has been a wonderful assemble of researchers, eight analytical articles and eight bi-monthly reviews and policy papers have been published. We're currently binding them into a one single collection of articles, which is going to be also available online on the project's website many other websites, and of course, uh, we, can, we can always share them over the email as well, if you just um, write us. So, uh, 
Finally, the final part, the thank yous, of course, uh, Danish Foreign Policy Society and Charlotte uh, and Elisaveta, both, well, well, Elisaveta is not yet here, but Charlotte, you have been absolutely great partners in, in putting this all together, and this event just yet again shows, uh, show, shows how important you have been and how wonderful it has been working with you, of course. Uh, European Humanities University and Irina Romanova, who has been somewhat the eyes and ears uh, in, in, in Belarus and has been contributing substantially to the, to the project and to the uh, research. Of course, also to the Cop University of, 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 of Copenhagen for giving us this wonderful premises. Uh, here you are, now I can see you. Uh, and uh, the Belarusian research community in general for the, for the wonderful input. Uh, and this project, of course, ha wouldn't be so successful as it has been if, if not for the, for the uh, great, great, uh, wonderful researchers that we have, and many of them are joining us today. And of course, Elizabeth is going to... You did a wonderful job in implementing the project on behalf of the, our institute, and uh, you have been instrumental and indispensable, and I'm truly thankful to you for, for holding this together and for putting this all on, on the right tracks, and moreover, for making this so successful that there is a, such a great continuation of the, of the project. So thank you very much uh, from, the, from the institute and from me personally as well. And of course, the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, who the financiers are always essential. The research doesn't, does happen without financiers. You know, as Oscar Wilde once said that uh, genius, uh, genius doesn't require money. And genius comes itself. But in this case, of course, uh, genius needs a support. And financiers are, are always essential. So OK, good. Let's discuss Belarus. Does it exist today? And what will it be tomorrow? I'm going to pass the microphone back to Charlotte. And please. Yes, and um, I think we'll, we'll start uh, with uh, Tatiana Astrovskaya, who will um, talk about will the world save us and the cultural roots of political opposition in Belarus. And I think also, just to add to Carlos, in, before I give you the word, I think one of the main sort of ideas behind the network when we started it was actually that we found it important not to forget Belarus. And we found it important because we knew that it would be very difficult to get information to a broader audience about Belarus. And this is actually the key idea, to get valuable, credible information about to, out to a broader and work around that. And, uh, and, and this has been the sort of the key issue. And we hope that we will actually, this will be a sort of a, 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 a turning point. So we'll have more and more people engaged in the network. So it'll be bigger and bigger, and thereby also have more and more impact into their wider world on, so, we will not forget Belarus, no matter what happens in, in, in the neighborhood. So with these words, uh, Tatiana, uh, please. Um, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so very much for the invitation and your kind introduction, Charlotte. Um, it is a great pleasure and honor to be here. In my short talk today, I won't repeat the main points I made in the AC for the Belarus Research Network on Neighborhood Policy Bulletin, but I will try to contextualize these points a bit more and affect why cultural resistance has been often treated as auxiliary, not so relevant, but it is actually matters. Um, and one more question for me is how this understanding of resistance, of dissent, can be of relevance today. I am a historian uh, and we'll talk about culture and I think it's, it's good also to start with, with culture. Um, so I think we do need a revision in this regard. Our view on these issues has been long dominated by a Russian-centered perspective, and I think this perspective limits our understanding significantly. The topic of dissent, the ways in which resistant to authoritarianism and dictatorship is possible when they are literally impossible, attracts much attention today. It has become, it has become as relevant as perhaps it hasn't been for a long time. Today we find ourselves looking at Russian and Belarusian societies expecting a reaction, a counteraction to the absolutely outrageous actions their governments undertake. And of course, Soviet era dissidents are perhaps the most obvious ready example to compare with. 
I personally find myself constantly attempting to compare, to look for solutions in the past. I'm asking myself why something was possible then and does not work now. How Soviet, mostly Russian dissidents, could not only make it to the Western media, but also, with the help of the Western public, stand for their rights by remaining behind the Iron Curtain. How could Jewish emigrants from the Soviet Union be so fearless uh, while writing and signing hundreds of petitions and finally effectively managing to emigrate, such as achieving what they demanded? And why, on the contrary, the peaceful Belarusian Revolution 2020, with hundreds of thousands of participants and all the efforts the Belarusian activists undertook, since then did not summon enough response outside Belarus? Why do Ukrainian scholars have to literally cry about their rights to be listened to in the discussions about the history and actuality of Ukraine, and still their expertise in many cases not taken into consideration? It is important to understand that the Belarusian society presents a unique opportunity for revision of research on resistance in Soviet history. Today, historian Michael David Fox remarked in the early 2000s that modern historians, um, no doubt, fortunately, writes David Fox, cannot experience Stalinism themselves. The same is certainly true for the dynamics of oppression and resistance during the late socialism. We cannot experience it ourselves. And yet, unfortunately, for the affected societies, including the Belarusian, historians now have the opportunity to get closer to the phenomena that oh, we, are, yes. we were, uh, were thought to be a thing of the past. History definitely does not repeat itself, but there are always those who wish for this repetition to occur. In this essay, I reflected the experience of Belarusian culture in the 1970s during the so-called Brezhnev stagnation and the trajectories of its development. This was a time that, as it seems, has been decisive for the events that are happening today, 1970s. The cult of the Second World War, or the Great Patriotic War, the instrumentalization of historical memory, the language of journalism and propaganda, the way the Soviet bureaucracy functions, the penitentiary uh, system, the structure and features of the Belarusian economy and industry, and finally, the ambivalence of Belarusian culture, the split between official and and alternative cultures, all these particularities we attribute Belarusian society today shaped to large extent precisely uh, at this time. After World War II and with the investments from the central Soviet Belarus indeed became a highly modernized country. Yet simultaneously the Belarusian culture and the Belarusian language were ultimately detached from the Soviet project of modernization. The same happened with Jewish culture. So on the one hand, Soviet Belarus was a success story that the Communist Party very much needed, yet on the other hand, modernization was not as simple and a straightforward process. In the 1970s, the inner contradictions between censure and periphery, national and international progress and tradition became palpable, but these contradictions were largely ignored by the party, but also in the West, which sought to undermine the Soviet system and looked for the simple, ready solutions. Looking at culture can be revealing here, because this was a domain where Soviet modernization did not mean means a solely progressive development. Maybe also because culture is something complex and it needs to be to, to refer to the previous tradition, whether reinterpreting, rethinking, or even denying it. The Soviet state uh, did manage to significantly increase education rates and mobility between urban and rural areas. So after the war, the new generation of Soviet people came, a new generation of the intelligentsia, which still originated from traditional peasant culture in most cases, but was already educated, emancipated, and privileged enough to be able to reflect critically on the discrepancy between the declaration and the reality of socialism. Ultimately, and this is what Western Sovietology and Slavic studies for a long time failed to comprehend, the issue of culture was one of the main stumbling blocks between the intelligence of the National Republics and the Communist Party. From the 1970s on, 
um, among intelligence, there grew the understanding that through culture and language, the regaining of political sovereignty subjectivity can be achievable. Anyway, this was the only domain that was left for the intelligence. The cultural activism was also directed against the secondary status of national literatures and cultures in comparison to Russian, against the hierarchical uh, relations between the center and periphery. It can be treated as a decolonizing endeavor using the language of contemporary debates. As you know, the phenomena of dissent and uncensored press in the Soviet Union, but also in the socialist bloc, have long been perceived through the experience and understanding of small circle of Russian, mainly Moscow and Leningrad dissidents, which in principle fitted very well into the logic on co confrontation between the East and West communist and capitalist system during the Cold War. The question of how suitable such optics are for the discontent practiced by the intelligence in the national republics, uh, which used mainly the means of cultural resistance for these purposes, remains open. It is apparent, however, that such approach diminishes the importance of cultural resistance, not paid attention to the diversity of its forms. I think it is possible to speak um, about the fluidity of cultural practices of cultural resistance. In this case, the act actors themselves and power holders do not always accurately record the moment of crossing the borders between per permitted and prohibited, and its effect can also be significantly delayed in the time. And um, yeah, this, this also happened with the Belarusian intelligence. Uh, um, and resistance in such cases, resistance in such cases was manifested through cultural and aesthetic actions. And to understand this requires probably an additional effort, um, and, but it should be done. Uh, recognition of the act, uh, act, uh, act of resistance also depended to a large extent on external conditions, but not less on the communications to the outside. And the communication and recognition, that is what, that is what, that is what very long have been disturbed, but this is this very black and white vision, uh, vision of dissent. Um, and one more remark, I'm going to my conclusion. So this is Alice Belatsky, who is also, as you know, the Nobel Prize winner to 20, uh, 22, and he also arrived at his political and human rights activism from a cultural activism, and actually he never abandoned his cultural engagement, which is often forgotten in contemporary discussions. So the Belarusian Revolution 2020, which impressed Europe and the world with its spectacular scale, creativity, and non-violent nature, seemed to have faded away, and yet it, the resistance continues. Yet so do the repressions. Whilst Putin's Russia, the suppression uh, in the Putin's in Putin's Russia, the suppression of dissent is gathering its speed. Its major target is still, as it seems, remain anti-war manifestation. Everything else is more or less possible. In Belarus, every in every non-conformist act, starting from asking bureaucrats inconvenient question to reading an author unauthorized book or telegram channel the official list of which already exists the hundreds and constantly expanding. Um, the centers are equal to terrorists or, or um, when you support political prisoners, this is also a criminal act. What kind of counteractions, um, if at all, uh, is possible under such circumstances? I think we, we insist on the primacy of political resistance, on the hierarchy of resistant practices. We won't be able to see and accept different forms of the later. Uh, to give voice to and include those who, for various reasons, found themselves in the grey or rather colourful zone of cultural opposition and whose micro-acts of dissent through action, thought, writing, reading allow the side door of cultural diversity to be kept open. And, the, and this, I think, is my answer to the question whether Belarus exists today from this point of view, from point of view of this um, oppositional cultural micro-acts, it, it does exist. Um, and as the Soviet experience and the revolution of 2020 have shown, the transition from cultural activism to political manifestation can happen very quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chachana. I think this is a, a very important point that actually the, the whole element of culture in resistance is extremely important in, in how the transition goes. 
I've been so fortunate to meet um, Alice Beliatsky many times, and uh, I was uh, actually when I asked him, uh, you know, how did you become a political activist? Uh, it, I found out that he was actually a, a student of literature, and uh, that he a uh, PhD even in literature, and had been uh, the um, uh, museum. Uh, head director for a, a museum of literature. Yeah, so uh, he definitely came from culture. He came to, from culture very politics, much. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is something that we take forward, and and you answered yes to the fact that Philippa still exists. Um, I have to, as moderator, apologize because I actually made a a, a, a mistake. I I I. Um, uh, I, I should have given the word to Viktor Shadutsky, mm -hmm. but uh, now uh, you uh, have the chance, and I look forward very much to your presentation, uh, Baltic and Nordic Studies in Belarus Past, Present and Future. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for invitation. Thank you to, for possibility to share my attitude to uh, so important uh, questions. I have some pictures. Uh, for you, certainly. And uh, if you want to go to from Copenhagen to Minsk uh, on foot, uh, you have to walk about 1,100 kilometers. Is it far or not? Yeah, but it's it's not possible to answer without comparison. And I can uh, I can give you uh, another examples. For example, the distance from Copenhagen to Tallinn, the main translation of the city, Danish city, you know. It's about the same, 1,060 kilometers. From capital of Denmark to capital of Finland, it takes the same amount of time to walk as uh, to Minsk. Obviously, it's not geographical distance that separates the Nordic countries, uh, Nordic countries and Belarus, but other, mainly political factors. An attempt to offer to Belarusians a new view of states of Baltic Sea region, including the Nordic countries, as historically and culturally close to Belarus was made at the Faculty of International Relations of the Belarusian State University. In 2004, Oh, please. Uh, in 2004, uh, the textbook, The Baltic Sea Region Culture Politics Society, was published in Belarusian and in Ukrainian. We have done it uh, with, together with uh, Ukrainian colleagues. And this publication was based on the translation of the book edited two years uh, earlier within the framework of the Baltic Sea University program uh, led by Uppsala University, uh, Sweden. Uh, article by Belarusian academics on topic democracy, national minorities, culture, la languages, security were added to uh, this translation, uh, translated text. Uh, the, uh, uh, certainly the manual was, or textbook was um, the basis for undergra undergraduate course that was taught for 15 years from 2006 to, to, to 2020 and was cancelled after professor's dismissal. It, uh, during this, this year, uh, 440 Belarusian and foreign students received certificates from the Baltic University program after successfully passing the examinations. Uh, it means that we tried to create the base for, for, for democratic issues, uh, for democratic attitude to Baltic region. Among the students, uh, there are some current uh, media personalities, but I will not, they are known in Belarusian community, like uh, Alexandra Pekin, Veronika Laputska, and others. Yeah, uh, certainly, the uh, conceptual, conceptual uh, approaches formulated in the textbook uh, and within the framework of the course were widely used in scientific publication of Belarusian research. They consent that Baltic Sea region is whole in the dual states of Northern. And they studied gen in, uh, Baltic uh, region in general or concrete uh, countries or individual states. For example, uh, Elisabetta dubinka Gushi, some colleagues know uh, her, in 2014 defending her thesis at the BSU on the topic foreign policy of Denmark. 1972-2012. Uh, Elisabetta Navoschik, 
defending her thesis Belarus and Swedish relation 1991 2017 in yeah and certainly I can continue continue the list what conceptual approaches were laid down uh, in the mentioned uh, training course I just uh, I just want to uh, underline four points first maybe it would be a little bit strange for you but we try to to support this point to, and to make more popular. The geographical boundaries of the Baltic Sea region are defined by the watershed, not only by, by uh, the coastal territory. Since half of Belarus territory falls within, uh, within the Baltic Sea watershed, it, it's, it's, it has uh, every right to participate in regional construction and uh, cooperation. It means that we pretend to be a part of Baltic Sea region. It's our clear idea, and I think I shared this idea with my students, and I gave you a number of the students. We, they think we want to be part of the Baltic Sea region. It's first our approach. And uh, not nine on not only nine state only uh, the participant of Baltic Sea region, but fourteen. We, we see. According to famous Finnish geographer Anse Passi, there are uh, four stages of formation of region. First stage, emergence of the idea of regional community. Second, formation of the concept about the peculiarities of the region and its boundaries. Uh, third, establishment of regional institutions. And fourth, establishment of regional system and regional consciousness. Consciousness, sorry. In our opinion, in our opinion, the Belarusian society has clear elements of the Nordic identity, which can and should be developed. It's based for democracy, future democracy. At any rate, Belarusians do not associate themselves with the South. Belarusian lands are closely connected with the Baltic and Northern Europe, not only by nature, climate, but also by history. And I can give you a lot of examples. In, in the case of Belarusian, the reg regional identity, Baltic, Northern, is not exclusive. It complements local, certainly, national, Islam, uh, Slavic, and East European identity. But uh, I think... Uh, uh, that uh, Baltic uh, Northern identity is very important for Belarus, for contemporary Belarus, for future Belarus. Why? In, a, in a, my opinion, Belarusians need the Nord Nordic identity. There is a pragmatic intention uh, in it. A strengthening of the Northern Nordic identity should lead to the adoption by the Belarusian democratic state of the Nordic model of socially oriented state. Democratic, socially oriented state. I know there is discussion about the social, social uh, state and so, but uh, I think it, it, has, it, it would be our model for our future. And I, I, I want to give the cit uh, citation uh, 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 of our, one of my students, maybe uh, she pronounced it in uh, 2008. We consider the Nordic model to be the best variant, wrote in 2008, one of my students, Natalia Koshevska. It's widely recognized that uh, the concept of the North uh, has evolved from a mere, sim mere symbol of a geographical location into a coherent social political ideology in practice that has the following future, a model of a welfare state, it's important for us. A rejection of an aggressive foreign policy, very important for Belarus, for future Belarus. A commitment to human rights, special attention to uh, environmental uh, uh, issues, preference for, for the development of international cooperation at the level of law politics, critical attitude to supranational forms of integration. You know, our big neighbor, Russia and uh, prefer integration with supranational uh, structures, and it, it's danger. It's a big danger. And certainly, uh, Lukashenko started his policy, the integration with Russia, many years ago because maybe he wanted to be a leader of Russia. 
but but it's very it was very dangerous it's it's very dangerous and now we are Belarus is in danger to be captured by Russia completely and Russia will destroy everything in Belarus and no chance no no, no but we will we hope for the chance and fourth point the Nordic countries are not large in population no certainly they do not uh, claim political and cultural dominance. Rather, they are examples of cultural diversity and tolerance. Uh, their strengths were clearly manifested in the modeling of Council of the Baltic Sea States, you know, but it was part of our, power, part of our, but it's old picture, but I wanted to show you, uh, to show you that, that we started it many years ago, but unfortunately now we cannot continue. You see the, the students, uh, they um, uh, try to present their country, for example, Denmark and so on. And, but, you know, it's very interesting. Results of the modeling that Russia was main enemy. Yeah. And it was uh, 15 years ago. Main enemy, main danger, and the main discussion uh, were between, from one side, Russia, delegation, so-called delegation, and from Baltic states and Poland. Yeah, uh, uh, certainly um, about uh, 20 years have passed since the first textbooks was published. A few days ago, the University of Uppsala published a collective monograph, Rethinking the Baltic Sea Region, Trends and Challenges in English, which claims to be a new textbook for students. In this book, 11 authors have presented uh, their scientific view on the main challenges and contradictions existing in the Baltic Sea region. A significant place in the monograph is devoted to Belarus. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, last, uh, next uh, pic uh, picture. Yeah, this book, but in a couple of weeks it would be in the internet. And also we added, we prepared also lecture, 11 topic and 11 lecture, in internet lecture. It would be maybe interesting for students because, you know, we cannot uh, propose uh, lecture to Belarusian students today, but we will do it uh, on distance. And, and also, I think it's very important. important. Uh, for example, authoritarian, uh, yeah, authoritarian regime continues to destroy everything national, everything positive. In scientific, also including the scientific sphere, it, it so happened uh, uh, that today the Belarusian State University hosted the defense of Andrei Valotskin's um, second thesis, formation of priority vectors of foreign policy of the Baltic states in uh, 1991, uh, 2014. Today, really, because I, but Dr. Valotskin can be considered the most active author who has been working for many years on the subject of Baltic states and the Baltic Sea region as a whole. Already on the, but today, what, what is the th his thesis today? On the first pages of the, his research, the author mentioned the speech of the Belarusian dictator, you know. And you can imagine <laughs> what assessment uh, will give to Baltic uh, states. Certainly, because he, in, 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 in another case, he cannot defend. He has to make propaganda. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a big uh, challenge, a big problem for, for Belarus. Yeah, but we retained, uh, it means that we, uh, we today Belarus um, repeats uh, of the patterns of the existed in the period of USSR in science and but but today we have 21st century you know not 50 years or 60 years ago with internet with communication and so on and certainly but uh, we can uh, say that uh, to, today the people in belarus researchers in Belarus cannot prepare good uh, researchers they have to just it's uh, there is a big fear and certainly the people who now live, uh, uh, live abroad, uh, we have to, to do our job for us and for our uh, colleagues uh, in Belarus. Certainly uh, uh, we need support and we have support from our colleagues. Foreign co Thank you very much for, for your support because 
you know, you know that after 2020, about 500,000 people left Belarus. You know, and the, the it's, uh, you know, the population of Belarus is now, my, I think, less than nine millions, and more active. You know, if we we, we can compare, for example, refugees from Ukraine, people uh, suffered from the war, but in Belarus they suffered from political. Uh, po political reasons, you know, and uh, hundreds of historians, <laughs> hundreds of researchers, and certainly they have to find uh, the possibility to to prepare, uh, to prepare a search together with our colleagues and to to give it to our young people, to to the students. It's a big uh, drama today, uh, you know. And certainly, that that uh, my conclusion that um, Belarus certainly future democratic Belarus. And then we, we talk about Belarus. What is it, Belarus? In reality, Belarus doesn't exist because there are two Belarus: authoritarian Belarus, Belarus uh, dicta uh, of dictator Lukashenko, and democratic Belarus. Certainly, it's uh, in democratic Belarus also has some institutions and try to increase uh, international subjectivity. And certainly there are a lot of problems, discussion and so on, but we have two Belarus. Authoritarian, total, going to, to, to totalitarian level, and democratic. And certainly for democratic Belarus, Certainly for, for authoritarian uh, Lukashenko Belarus, Nordic country, Nordic models, Baltic region is enemy, is enemy. But for democratic, for democratic Be Belarus, uh, you are the, uh, the, the, how to say, the good model, good supporter. And this is my answer for, for the question. And also the way to, to you, uh, they of Ukraine, to NATO and European Union, certainly, leads through Baltic Sea region and Nordic countries, because you understand the situation, particularly our uh, no, Baltic, uh, um, uh, uh, Baltic uh, countries, because they know past present and uh, future. Thank you very much for your attention. I just uh, want to say that maybe some of you, the members here in the, in, in, actually visited your university and uh, uh, when we were, uh, when the Danish Foreign Policy Society visited Belarus in 2017, I think we definitely came by your, yeah, at that you. time you could Still work relatively freely, uh, yeah. but um, apparently you could not do today. Uh, I was, so I was fired from, from but I'm happy, you know. Because, yeah, yeah. You know really, what, <laughs> it's, yeah. I was fired, but uh, in, in 2021 uh, uh, for my political, uh, for, for my civil um, position and research position, because I, you know, but it's a long story, sorry. Thank yeah, you. but still you have some students here that are doing a good job uh, uh, so and and who led me and led us to to your institute at that time and i also remember how surprised i was when we had the presentation at how freely things were expressed at that time uh, so i thought there was freedom of thought somehow at the university at that time but of course it was maybe only a small pocket um, the other thing i think which is interesting in 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 your presentation is the fact like if we imagine that russian didn't exist uh, or uh, didn't uh, try to uh, exert influence anyway um, then you are actually saying that belarus would be part of a, a nordic baltic region and so you know we can imagine you know how how are we forming what is what is the future of uh, of of Europe, what would it look like? And this is actually what your, you could say, messaging is that there is a, a natural affinement of Belarus and the population of Belarus and the placement of Belarus, the geostrategic placement of Belarus, actually towards the Nordic Baltic region. Is that uh, so? If we imagine the future, how does it look like and how does it? Uh, if we should vision where where are we going, that would be the mm, yeah. 
Um, then I think actually um, we do have, I think um, in, we'll take one more presentation and then we'll just take uh, 10 minutes of uh, questions uh, from the audience before then going on again. So I'm um, happy to introduce uh, Pavel Tereskovic, who is a PhD in history, coordinator of the Belarusian Association of Education and Science. And he will speak on the Belarus language identity, the state and farewell to illusions. And uh, he has also been speaking here before. Um, and if you, uh, Victor, could give uh, the mic to him, then uh, we, we can proceed. So welcome and uh, thank um, you. Thank you very much for invitation for this conference. And first of all, I, I would like to say terribly sorry because I changed the topic of my presentation. Okay. <laughs> uh, in program, in program, this presentation. But I, I presented this text last year in Copenhagen uh, on the conference devoted to this solution, 30 years of the solution of the Soviet Union. So today I, I would like to speak on another topic, not only on Belarus, but also on Belarus, but a, about contemporary dictatorships. And I uh, selected this metaphor, uh, oops, uh, this uh, metaphor, uh, the grammar of contemporary dictatorships, past is continuous, future indefinite. Why, why grammar? Because the grammar is the basic rules for reading, writing, and understanding. So I do think that today we need new rules how to read, how to understand, and how to write about dictatorships. And I would like to start uh, with um, um, yes, why why we need new vocabulary of dictatorships. Uh, last year there were a lot of discussions on the nature of the political regime in the modern Russia, and experts and specialists divided on the two parts. One part said that this is a clear fascism. And another said, no, it's not fascism. And I participated in the number of such discussions. And those who was against uh, this said, you see, we, we didn't see in Russia a single political party. We didn't see in Russia a, a massive political mobilization. We didn't see ideology. This is not fascism. And each time, uh, it, uh, it was like I hear uh, a deep sign of relief in auditorium experts, and they say, oh, okay, it's not fashion, it's okay, it's something different. But I have the question, uh, is it better than fascism, or is it worse than fascism? What is this? And the problem is the main, how to read a uh, modern contemporary dictatorship. And you see uh, some specialists uh, even announce the semantic default, stressing the inability uh, the, of the using of the research optics of the 20th century towards the contemporary reality of dictatorship. And it's uh, absolutely uh, evident that uh, unlike to the classic totalitarian regimes of the 20th century, postmodern contemporary dictatorship do not rely on the solid ideology and mass scale political mobilization. Nevertheless, uh, they are enough effective to fulfill the main goal to preserve the personal power of the leader. And uh, Yes, thank you very much. The morphology of contemporary dictatorships, uh, the place of the bright future, it, it's uh, an essential part of the totalitarian ideology of the last century. Now it's occupied by emptiness. There is no clear picture of what will be in the future in Russia and Belarus, in Iran and China, etc. Uh, propaganda replaced by the agitatement. And you see uh, last year in Berlin was a, a conference on the ideology of Ruski world, Ruski Mir, and uh, one of the participant journalists from Russia said that 
under the Soviet Union, uh, uh, the propaganda was 95%, Soviet propaganda was 95% was ideology and 5% political technology. Now in Russia, it's changed completely. 95% of political technology and just 5% of ideology. There is no great style uh, in uh, contemporary dictatorships. No great style and architecture like uh, Stalinist Empire or, or uh, fascist uh, architecture in Italy and, and Germany. Uh, no uh, uh, big style in music, in cinema, and etc. And it's replaced by primitive example of patriotic mass culture. Uh, uh, Contemporary dictatorships based on the populist demagogy and sophisticated propaganda. And they need permanently increase the level of violence towards the political opponents. Inevitably, such escalation leads to large-scale terror towards own people, war with the neighbors or both. And the logic of dictatorship ontology produced 2020 in Belarus and uh, a large-scale uh, invasion of Russia to Ukraine in 2022. Uh, Past is continuous is as a typical feature of contemporary dictatorship. Modern dictatorships, especially in Russia and Belarus, desperately cling to the past to avoid undesirable future. History becomes the object of manipulation from which everything undesirable is removed. And first of all, historians, professional historians. And now we know uh, uh, Quite, quite bad is that the main targets of the repressions in the uh, academic community of Belarus are historians and linguists, and first of all, the specialists in Belarusian uh, language and Belarusian literature. The phonetics of history is reduced to minimum of sound they are needed solidly to justify their violence. An imaginary past devours the present, uh, turning into the endless reiteration of the totalitarian practice. Uh, please, uh, next slide. And uh, uh, in general, uh, uh, why, uh, uh, why uh, uh, the situation in the world now isn't good for, for democracy? According, according to the democracy index, the uh, average uh, uh, political temperature in the world is uh, uh, 529 from the possible 10. It means that now we lived in the politically hybrid world. You see that only 8% of population of the world now lives in a full democracy, 37% in the slave democracies, and uh, more than half of population of the world in the hybrid regimes and autocracies. And pure autocracies are uh, uh, almost 37% of populations. And uh, I would like to stress that the biggest democracy in the world is India. India is a 17% of of population of the world. This is 50% uh, uh, of the democratic world. And uh, uh, I like uh, very much this metaphor, does Belarus exist? Because it's a replica of the does India exist? And my question is, does India is a democratic state? There is very strong anti-Western intention. And uh, I noted that India support much more uh, Putin's regime after the invasion to Ukraine, even in China, but we still consider that this is a democratic, democratic state. And uh, uh, you see, Belarus uh, has index is uh, uh, about 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 two, and this is number uh, 153 from 167 countries. And uh, uh, Belarus in this index in between Eritrea and Iran, and means that uh, uh, our situation is better is better than than in Iran. For me, it's of course a question. Next slide, please. 
And uh, another question, why autocracy is so popular now? For several decades, we used to think that democracy is the equivalent of prosperity. But if it's so, you see that the most prosperous autocracy, Qatar, uh, uh, has uh, uh, 82,000 GDP per capita per year. And uh, the less prosperous democracy is the African country, Lesotho, is just 1,000 uh, per year. And the biggest democracy, India, is just uh, uh, 2,600 per year. This is, uh, uh, this is the figures uh, about, about, about democracy. And of course, the major part of uh, autocratic regime are uh, based on the uh, exploitation of natural resources. And it's uh, petrocracies, but out of petrocracies, the most prosperous country is China, with, with a quite quite good uh, 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 figures on GDP GDP per capita. And you see, uh, this is the last report of Bloomberg Economics that autocracies now generate uh, 46% of the world GDP. 30 years ago, it was uh, just 23%. And uh, according to this report, autocracies become more and more self-sufficient. Uh, they are not dependent from the uh, point of economy from the democratic countries. Next slide, please. And uh, some, some, some good news. Uh, you see, we live in the world of the bashful dictatorships. It means that there is no any one dictator in the world who want to say, I am dictator. And we have 159 republics in the world, but in reality, they, they, are, not, they are not republics, they are not democratic states. And uh, uh, sometimes they uh, invented uh, another form of democracy, it means uh, uh, people's democracy, or uh, people's republic, or democratic republic, or uh, uh, socialist people, democratic republic, and in 95 percent of the cases, this is a uh, mark that it's uh, authoritarian, authoritarian state, and uh, it's a shame to be named dictator today. And just the last case is that uh, Chinese foreign minister summoned the German ambassador when uh, uh, Annalena Baerbock called Xi Jinping dictator. Oh. It's, it's a problem for him. And to my mind, Jean Bedel Bacas, a former dictator of the Central African Republic, was at least sincere when he called himself as an emperor, because it's quite a closer to reality than to call it as a prime minister or president. And the next slide, please. Some hopes for the, for the uh, a better future. Uh, uh, despite of the domination of the non-democratic uh, political uh, regimes in the world, uh, the imagined normal polity today is shaped by the pattern of the United States Declaration of Independence and American institutions. This is a standard for all uh, over the world. And it means that most stupid autocrat understands that he, <laughs> and, uh, usually it's he, not she, uh, he should have some kind of constitution, parliament, and election. And we should uh, to use this contradiction in between political performance and reality to provide new vocabulary of dictatorships. That is why I do think it possible to discuss absolutist and constitutional dictatorships, presidential and parliamentary dictatorships. And uh, uh, I ask, uh, first of all, uh, researchers and journalists stop to use this term president toward Lukashenko, Putin, etc. I give you example. Uh, let's imagine this, this bottle could speak. And this bottle said, I'm full bottle of cognac. <laughs> but this is an empty bottle of the water. The same with the president. St stop to name them president, their dictators, their animals. Thank you very much for attention. Jack is welcome.
Thank you so much, uh, Pavel. Uh, I just wanted to remind you of uh, what happened at the UN Security Council recently, where uh, Belarus uh, asked not to be called a regime. <laughs> so that's uh, your point, uh, Pavel. Yeah. I think actually we will just have um, 10 minutes for questions to the three panelists who have been talking so far, just so before we carry on with the last presentation. So um, uh, I don't know whether there are some questions in the audience. Uh, yes, yes, please, yeah. Just, just to take a mic so we'll have it on the live stream. Yeah. And please present yes, yourself. Yeah, my name is Kim Bjornstrup. Um, I think it's very interesting to listen to everything that's said here, and I have deep respect for people that fight, uh, whether it's via culture or, or other ways uh, for their country. So don't uh, misunderstand my question. But uh, we've seen many times that when one dictator goes, he's just substituted by another. And how do you, how do you think that can be prevented because I, I looked a little into the history of Belarus and there's not like a long tradition of democracy and independent courts and, uh, and this kind of stuff. So if Lushenko is gone tomorrow, don't you think he's just going to be substituted by another one of the pack? Um, Pavel, would you start uh, maybe then you can each have, uh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to wait for the, yeah. Or maybe we'll just take a, um, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so the question is, uh, what uh, when uh, Lukashenko gone, uh, what will be in the future? And uh, if Belarus has any tradition of democracy? You see, w once again, it's, it's uh, my opinion that uh, our political life in the world is shaped by the uh, uh, United States Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution. And the uh, first Belarusian state was proclaimed, Belarusian People Republic was proclaimed in 1918. And it, it has no constitution, but it had several proclamation uh, which are uh, uh, sounds like the Declaration of Independence of United States and American Constitution. We, uh, we had in the past uh, Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, but it also has consti had constitution. And it also proclaimed that the only source of the power, only source of sovereignty in Belarus is the people. So I hope we could use this tradition, this understanding uh, for our better future. And I hope that uh, Lukashenko is a, a so strong, poisoned, poison for Belarusians that in the future we will now have no any dictators at all. Thank you. Maybe I will uh, also... Uh, Certainly, Lukashenko was elected by democratical way in 1994. Uh, majority supported him, but he lost in 2020. You know, majority people were against him. But uh, because society has shown uh, the people are against, because we have new generation, independent generation. We have new, how to say, uh, new spheres of economy, for example, uh, business and so on. And all of them, all of them as a middle class, they were against of uh, this ar archaic regime. And, and certainly, but Lukashenko, you know, he was called by, as a political animal. And he, he was so-called uh, quite clever because he, he has created very strong police uh, uh, repression system, uh, vertical repression systems. And unfortunately, society without weapons, without any good coordination, you know, they could, they could not defeat Lukashenko regime. But in reality, and now society, society is under 
very strict violence, and we can compare the Belarus with a big concentration camp. You know, it's it's a truth. It's and also some some researchers and also it's it's truth that we have a hot war in Ukraine, but we have hybrid cold war in Belarus. Yeah, thank you. If you could pass it to this man over here. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, my name is Edens. I have been sitting here wondering, as I understand it, at least a couple of you guys are living in Belarus. What kind of risk do you have returning? And the other question is, that's for, Mu, for you, uh, Dr. Tereskov. Tereskovic? Yeah. I think uh, I could add together that your percentages were about 140% in one of the first slides. <laughs> yeah. And maybe if you could ask the, at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Well, my name is Prime Bunde. I just wonder, maybe I'm a little stupid, but uh, you said they had no weapons, but what happened? What is the difference between the population in Ukraine and in Belarus? Because the same situation when they elected Yanukovych and so on, and he was not elected, but uh, then you have all these demonstrants, and they they succeeded in getting rid of uh, their uh, leader, and uh, now we are, they are fighting in uh, Ukraine. What is what is the situation for the Belarus uh, population in this respect? Yeah, I have some experience. I start, uh, was in this process in 2017. Uh, lost a job uh, in my country. Went to Ukraine. I uh, see. Uh, I saw how the war in Ukraine started. Uh, then I come to Poland. I was inside these processes. Uh, so. Possibly you will consider my uh, my opinion uh, useful. First of all, I want I want to remind you that uh, the, the history of this conflict uh, between Ukraine and Russia started not uh, to one year ago. It started in 2014. Ukraine has uh, has oligarchs, uh, which. Uh, some supported Russia, some supported uh, Ukraine as an independent state. So it was also a fight between these uh, two, uh, and they, are, they were ready for this fight. We don't have weapon, we don't consider Russia as our enemy at, at that time. So we, our society was not ready for the war with Russia, you understand? And uh, I can make some insight from... Uh, in my presentation, possibly <clears throat> it uh, can put some light. Uh, uh, Lukashenko destroyed uh, Belarusian society for these 30 years, uh, uh, destroyed leaders of the opinions, etc. So Belarusian were not ready to uh, to fight to to, to fight this uh, aggression from Russia. Lukashenko prepared the food, uh, the uh, the ground for this aggression. It was. For years, he destroyed his leaders, the public opinion. Uh, he tried to this uh, to 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 he Belarusians were not ready uh, m mentally to fight for their, their independence. They didn't understand that you know, the 2020 it was threat for independence. We fight with the dictatorship. We fight with this violence, but we don't realize that it is threat for our independence, for our existence as an independent country. Today, if we will have the weapons, and, uh, and it, another important, important thing, that Belarusian army was not with, uh, with us, you understand? Now, army in Ukraine fight with Ukrainians, but Belarusian army is uh, with <laughs> the dictator and with Russia, yes, you understand? And this is uh, the big difference. Yeah, certainly. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I... I uh, <laughs> very, very deep question. Certainly, if you will compare the state, Belarusian state, and the Ukrainian state, Ukraine had a lot of a lot of democratic characteristic. It was unstable democracy. They had f fractions uh, in parliament. They had 
some region, democratic region, uh, like Lviv region, for example. But uh, for example, uh, certainly, uh, but Belarus was really, Lukashenko created really dictatorship without any possibilities. And sometimes we compare Belarus with North Korea. And it's, it's truth. Because repression are so strong. In Ukraine, certainly, we, we had discussion. Maybe they had discussion, parties, democratic elections. For example, they had, during uh, the independence, uh, in the independence, they, had, uh, they have five presidents. In Belarus, only one. Because first election were democratic, and other, other uh, elections were not democratic. But maybe people say, OK, observers, maybe 50% he could get, get but uh, 2020, no. And certainly, yeah, but different regime, different regime. Because dictatorship, they didn't allow to, 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 to do anything. The parliament was controlled from uh, 1996 and so on. Uh, set, uh, and sadly, it, it, it's a big differences, big differences between Ukraine and Belarus. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and uh, will you uh, do yours? Yeah. Okay, some words about uh, difference uh, between uh, Ukrainian and Belarusian regimes. Um, sorry, between Ukrainian and Belarusian states. Uh, about roots of dictatorship, especially in Belarus. Uh, but I think that maybe we forget about, about social structure in Belarus, but it's very uh, important because in Belarus, Belarus is more military uh, part of the USSR. It's uh, so uh, in Belarus was very many officers. So many. It's I think that maybe it's one uh, first place. Almost. Yeah, yeah. And for understanding what does it mean, Belarus and Belarusian society, I think it's very important. It's first uh, uh, thing. And the second thing uh, about differentiation between Belarus and Ukraine. Ukraine very big country with, very, uh, with uh, um, I think that maybe some regional uh, specialities. Uh, it's about, uh, I, I don't know, I don't remember exactly how many people, how many population in Ukraine. It was like a 40, million. 40 million. Yes, and in Belarus it's only 10 million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, uh, I think that it's, it's important. And in Belarus we have some big, uh, I don't know, um, enterprises. It's, I think that it's, it's too interesting thing. And uh, if we talk about uh, Belarusian dictatorship and roots of dictatorship in Belarus, I think that it's, it's interesting. If we talk about social structure, and social structure in Belarus uh, change uh, in time. And we have right now some, I think, look, look like uh, middle class and uh, IT, uh, I think that it's a concept of IT country yeah, I think that this uh, work, and when we <coughs> take this, I mean protests in 2020, it's uh, consequences of these social changes, in, I mean social structure in Belarus. Ukraine, it's another country, very different, very different from uh, Belarus. Thank you very much. And then the last comments, and then we'll move on to the presentations again. Uh, yeah, so um, I just wanted to uh, maybe to throw back uh, to the to the audience you are asking does belarus has a constitutional history does Bel why belarusians are not fighting for democracy but actually there was a very strong uh, democratic movement in belarus since 1980s and um, did you actually as as western um, as western society as western democracies care about, about what is going on in Belarus? Did you think us, this, this small kind of country is actually matter in, in all this process of democratization? Did anyone at all thought that this would be a kind of this, um, this way to, to dictatorship, which Belarus was actually sliding in for 30 years? Uh, um, that actually, it, it, 
anyone cared about this, yeah? And there were always these people, and there were a lot of them. I also tried this to show in my presentation. People like Alex Belyatsky, who fight, he started in uh, 1981 or even 80, he started to fight for democracy in his land. And when you read his papers, and he is clearly already understands at this time uh, that it is important. But he started from culture, and he started because this was the only possible field. But now one actually listen to him and other like-minded people. So I think it's, it's I mean, also Ukrainians uh, keep telling this, that this, even if the land is small, but it still matters, yeah, but what is going there. And there were a lot of, pos of, 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 um, of attempts to, to, to support the democracy within the Belarusian societies. But yes, they failed mm. at the moment, mm -hmm. but we still hope against hope. Yeah. Yeah, the the first question was actually on on whether uh, anybody's are you living? None of you are living in Belarus at the moment, are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you are? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you have to answer uh, that question. Uh, yeah, uh, certainly. You you know, for example, that uh, five thousand people now in the prisons as a political poets. Belatsky is one example. Our colleague with Rosa, because we were fired from uh, Faculty of International Relations. And um, 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 our colleague, he wrote just a letter to support, U uh, uh, support Ukraine, to support stop war. And he was sentenced, sen sentenced to eight years in a prison. The uh, that, uh, um, associate professor, good uh, lawyer, Father of three uh, three children, you know, and incredible. Yeah, but uh, five thousand people, they officially rec not rec not officially recognized, but uh, officially recognized about two thousand because n some people don't want to talk to say about their political reasons because, you know, the uh, the repressions against parents, children, and so on. I left and I was fired. But uh, my wife was fired from university uh, as a teacher because she participated in some uh, manifestation. Yeah, and she was um, uh, she was invited to KGB, and the lady uh, she 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 was very afraid, and you know, emotionally. And I said. To her, maybe you you can live in Minsk in somewhere, but without mobile telephone. You know, mobile telephone helps the police to to find the people, because without mobile telephone it's possible to survive. But without uh, with mobile telephone it's not possible. No, but I got I, I've got the invitation to to go to German university, and certainly we we certainly we went to, to Germany, and uh, but. Uh, and certainly, I don't know, that period it was not maybe dangerous because I was ready to, to go to prison. But I gave some couple interview and, and I've got a, so a lot of critics, a central newspaper, central television, Shadursky is a spy on. Spying and the people like that uh, he has to be sentenced to, to, to death penalty, you know. I, I have a lot of material, but it's not rumors, it's not comments, it's a central newspaper, Sovietska Belarus, you know, and Rosa, you know, it's, 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 and you know, and, and, and last, um, last um, article was, he created from, from uh, something like, uh, something dangerous from faculty. He's, he's uh, responsible for this. Because I told you, we have created the European approach, Baltic Sea region approach. But now it's its main critic, because he he's spying, he, he got a lot of money. And certainly, it's dangerous for me to return back. And you know, I'm nearly a pensioner, but uh, you know, I don't know about my future because I was a dean of the faculty of <laughs> university, you know. But uh, but yeah, but I'm happy because I cannot support this regime, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, it's it's impossible because I cannot sit in Rosa. We cannot uh, sit in then our colleagues is in in the, uh, in the prison, 
Mm. And there in this small room, three, four, three meters, nine meters square, 15 people in one, one room. It's, it's something, you know, uh, incredible. It's a yeah. torture. Yeah. It's very hot, you know. It's, it's not, it's, I, I, I answer a little bit emotionally, but in reality, every day we live in, in that. And for example, my son, uh, unfortunately, is in, Be in Belarus. Uh, uh, but, you know, every day, but okay, Mufasa, I will sit, uh, I will go to prison, but for a couple of years, but don't worry. But I, I told him, don't, don't worry, my son, if you will ask, my, uh, tell them, my, I don't have any relation with my, my father. Because, we, you know, Stalin period, 100% Stalin period, you know, congratulations, historians, politologues, because we can, they, they, can they, 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 they have returned back, you know, it's a reality. And that's why, you know, but, you know, one girl, students, and I, I have prepared 25, um, uh, how to, essay of students under repression. Uh, Rosa uh, prepared uh, essay of teachers. I have prepared essay, not prepared, uh, coordinated, 24. And girls, 19 years old, were two years in the prison, you know, students. And she, she, she told, you know, my, my wife and cried, you know, because, because but for what? For just, for, for just, uh, yeah, you know, some petitions, some, uh, flags. yeah, uh, flags, and two years. But in, in reality, and uh, maybe uh, I have this, and we, we think, uh, think how to maybe translate of this uh, uh, short yeah. text. Maybe if you are interested, because it's a real, 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 uh, real stories. From, because I know your, your country uh, also suffered from, from Nazi period, but it was... It was not, nothing, <laughs> you know, nothing you, cannot you, be compared. But our young people, 20 yeah. years uh, old, yeah. they know it, you know. Yeah. And, and we, we have to talk, tell it to youth, to youth, Danish mm -hmm. youth, Latin, because democracy has to be uh, st uh, strong. We have to support democracy. It's, it's like, it's not gift, it's... it's it's necessary. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. And thank you so much. I think, uh, I think what um, is important in what you're saying is the courage. Uh, but no, we, we need to carry on because uh, unfortunately, uh, Elisabetta and uh, Carlos has to, uh, to go on. So um, I have to pass on the word to Elisabetta first before I can give it to Sergei. And uh, so we have to carry on and then we'll talk afterwards again yeah right thanks very much yeah. Charlotte, and thank you everyone i think it's going to be a bit tough for me to now uh actually um, give my speech um also because of the content of it but but certainly because of the very sort of emotional um and important uh, topics we just discussed and i think that for people living in the West, very often it's hard to even imagine what type of reality people that have been engaged in protests in 2020 that are still being in prison today, they're still being caught in the streets, you know, uh, without much explanation and without much due process. Uh, I think it's very, very difficult for us to fathom um, what type of um, reality that is, um, which is also why uh, we decided to start this network. Um, and also I'm from Latvia and uh, growing up there, I, I think um, we've come to the conclusion that we have to fight for democracy and freedom every day, especially since the war in Ukraine started. But let's not forget that before the war in Ukraine restarted, by the way, because the war started in 2014, um, there was a belligerent occupation of Belarus. And I think very, very few Western countries were actually awake to this fact. Um, and I think that the Baltic states and Poland um, have been warning uh, the Westerners about this for quite a while. Uh, but unfortunately, our voices are only now heard today uh, when we are seen as actually having some type of special knowledge on um, former um, USSR states. But here, I want to start um, by saying that I did write um, an essay which was more a view from Riga, so the capital of Latvia, and it touched upon the Wagner Rebellion. Uh, so I think it's a little bit outdated. Uh, so I want to expand a little bit on my idea. And I finished my essay in the last paragraph speaking about the view from Riga on Belarus, which looks at it as a co-joint co twin uh, of Russia. 
Uh, and now I think it's a very ugly thing to say. Uh, but unfortunately, the Latvian foreign policy line has merged uh, Belarus and Russia today. And I think that very much is my first answer to the question, does Belarus exist today? And um, here I want to quote the report of the foreign minister of Latvia of last year which says, the growing contingent of Russian troops in Belarus, the deployment of a regional grouping of joint armed forces on the territory of Belarus and the further integration of Belarus and Russia in the form of United States at the expense of Belarus's sovereignty continue to increase instability and aggravate the security situation in the region. Now, why do I find these types of quotes alarming? It is because Latvia, like Poland, uh, Lithuania and Ukraine, now we share a history with Belarus that is much, much longer than that of the USSR or that of the Russian Empire, and actually that stems back to the Polish and Lithuanian Commonwealth. So we have taken upon ourselves for the last 30 years to actually advocate that Belarus does have a European past. And we have always hoped that Belarus will have a European future. So this is exemplified by 2015. Latvia was one of the countries of the EU that were advocating for lifting, lifting certain, not all, but certain sanctions from Belarus after seeing the freeing of some political prisoners. So every time Belarus had an inter internal policy cycle trying to kind of um, manipulate both the West and the East, so the EU and Russia, in its own favor, Latvia tried to respond because it saw it as an opportunity to keep the Belarus in the orbit of the European Union and thus reinvigorate the relationship between Belarus and the European Union. Now, nowadays the situation has definitely changed, of course, because of the stolen election of 2020, which is, of course, the elections have been stolen since 1994 the weaponization of migration against Latvia and Lithuania and Poland, which I believe is the most important factor. Of course, the belligerent occupation that I mentioned, and this is very important, we should not forget that it's not only Ukraine, but also Belarus that has been occupied by Russia, and of course, becoming a platform of Russia's war to Ukraine. So it has really drastically changed our stance, and this does not only touch upon uh, our foreign policy, it only concerns real lived experiences of people in Latvia, which is a country that shares a border of 170 kilometers with Belarus. Here I can mention the amendments to the law on immigration that we have passed, which actually prevents the citizens of Russia and Belarus to actually um, acquire first time temporary residence permits in Latvia. Yes, so the, regardless of the fact that we do share history, in fact, it's very, very hard for Belarusians now that are seeking you know, refuge to actually enter Latvia. Because at the moment, we see both the Russian and Belarusian citizens as threats. Now, of course, if we're talking about foreign policy, we also have to talk about um, internal security. Now, we already mentioned this. Belarus has been carrying out hybrid war since 2021 towards Latvia, Lithuania and Poland. And Latvia has now, together with Poland and Lithuania, been building permanent border fences. About 80% of the border fence between Latvia and Belarus now has been constituted. And we are also planning to build it in swampy areas, which means that basically we will close the seal the border completely with Belarus. Uh, we have just sealed one of the two border crossings in Silene. And this was actually done in the framework with the largest comprehensive military defense exercise in Latvia in May 2023, where we have NATO troops participating together with the Canadian and the United States troops, which of course is carried out not only to increase the presence of Latvian army and um, the allied forces in eastern parts of Latvia and show the determination of NATO and Latvia to protect itself, but it is of course also done in order to show Belarus that we will not stand the hybrid warfare that has been carried out towards us. It should be noted that the changes uh, and the deterioration of the quality of the regime going towards, indeed, as it was mentioned, totalitarian in Belarus has also changed the way our internal security structures function. So the Latvian border guards have been granted special powers, such as only granted previously in state of emergency to prevent any type of border crossings of the green border. So green border is the border that is not an official border crossing. And this, of course, means that they are now patrolling the 
border, in fact, in full-on gear, which will protect them from any type of attack. Let's not forget that the Wagner forces very recently were a big topic. They were in Belarus, and we were, of course, very worried that they may actually be planning or plotting something towards us. Now, um, just thirdly, to say that uh, we have also updated our state defense concept, because we understand that the geopolitical environment is changing very, very quickly. And it mentions that the first and primary threat of Latvia is Russia. But of course, implying that this is also Belarus, because officially we do see it as a platform for the military forces to launch an attack on Ukraine, and by consequence, the attack may also be turned towards us. And of course, Latvia is advancing very, very quickly to, you know, in fact, increase the resilience of the population. Let's not forget that in Latvia, about 30% of the population is Russian-speaking, which also means they're more susceptible to information warfare and disinformation, which is, of course, not in the favor of our state. And this, of course, means that we will be increasing the communication information that could increase civil safety. And this is not in favor of kind of... Um, if we think about you know, any type of relationship with Belarus, I think for a good period of time until the war ends and we actually see some type of change, there is no way of going back to relationships with official Minsk. However, having said this, I want to say that there are many opportunities for us to renegotiate the answer I have given so far. So firstly, I said official Minsk, right? So we have the two different types of Belaruses, I guess there could be three or more. There are different experts that put, and I'm not Belarus, I, I don't have the right to say this, but I think, first of all, um, the official position of Latvia is that we will only collaborate with the democratic Belarus, right? So that means that is the silver lining of the relationship, there is still hope. And it is not that Belarus does not exist for Latvia. It does, it's a very real objective threat, but we are ready to collaborate with a democratic Belarus. And in 2022, Latvian, now ex-foreign minister, met with Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, and it confirmed the firm position of Latvia to actually you know, support Belarus in case the political prisoners are released, new elections and independent elections are held. However, I want to say that Latvians are never naive when it comes to the East. There, it is unclear what are the preconditions within the, within the country, for instance, also a united opposition that would create and ensure the path towards democratization. And I think when we talk about a democratic Belarus in the future, perhaps we are idealist. Perhaps we need to negotiate about something else. Um, and last but not least, around 3% of the people of Latvia um, identify themselves as Belarusian. Right? So they may be Russian speakers, they're often, you know, hodgepodge together, uh, you know, as ethnic Russians. This is not the true. These are people who use Russian at home, but they identify as Belarusian. We have organizations such as Supolka uh, and the Latvian-led organization Free Belarus that was uh, put in place after the protests of 2020. And they have been actively, both of them, organizing activities in Riga. They're regular activities, not least this Saturday, me and Lizaveta Dubinka Husha there in the background will be representing the network, collaborating with the Latvian Contemporary Art Festival Survival Kit. So there is in fact interest not only from polit political scientists, but also from artists. The free <coughs> Belarusian flag, flag with Pahonia is hanging next to the Ukrainian flag at the Latvian National Library, right in the heart of Riga. And I want to say that I think this does represent the support of Latvia to a free and democratic Belarus. We know there is hope. And I also want to say we just taught a course at the master's level um, at Riga Stradinch University. So it's not just us, it's the students. We are doing the work to pass on the knowledge. And I think this is probably what small democracies, which also, by the way, established themselves in 1918. So there are many points, many more points in history that we share with Belarus. This is our job, and we hope that the West will hear us. Thank you. I actually will rush on quickly to Sehi, um, because we are running a bit late, um, uh, to Sehi and myself. Who will, uh, who's a PhD in economics and coordinator of the project Corporate Governance in Belarus, uh, and will be speaking about Belarus against the post-Soviet empire and dictatorship. What's uh, a better scenario for us in 2022? 
Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to say I'm not a politologian, uh, pol 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 politologist, so I will present some my points of view how uh, as an economist and some insight from these uh, processes I was involved. Um, I hope you will, will consider this uh, point of, of uh, this uh, my opinion uh, of some use of, of useful for uh, for you as a professionals as a uh, professional politologist as far as I understand. Uh, well, <sighs> I hope I can make some uh, useful contributions to today's discussion. During my presentation, I would like to answer the following question. The first one is, uh, did we have a better scenario in uh, 2020? And does Belarus exist today? Or what is Belarus like today? And how to make sure that Belarus continue to exist without Lukashenko and Putin? So was there a better scenario for us in 2020? Uh, and uh, my opinion, uh, my uh, answer is no, there, there wasn't. Putin wanted Belarus as a springboard for an attack on Ukraine. He did not reach Kiev in 2014. There, the Ukrainian uh, army was weaker. He probably decided to correct his mistake in uh, 2022. Uh, I think it was uh, the suppression of protests and the hybrid occupation of Belarus is uh, part of his preparation for the war with, with Ukraine. Uh, Uh, in addition, the suppression of protests in Belarus, where hundreds of thousands of people took uh, to the street, uh, gave a clear signal to Russian society also from Putin's point of view. Uh, it was no matter how many of you there are uh, on the streets, my repressive uh, machine and I will still roll you into the ground. And I think it was also uh, a part of his preparation because he expected some kind of protest from Russian society who don't, who don't want this aggression. So it will be a good example from Belarus, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, such kind of uh, uh, suppression of protests and uh, violence, etc. And he show it works, this, I can do this. Even if uh, millions of Russians will go to the streets, I will do the same as uh, Lukashenko and I did uh, in Belarus. And I think we made uh, two mistakes in 2020. First of all, uh, we didn't understand that the enemy of Belarus is not in Drasdi and the main enemy of Belarus is in Kremlin. And I, th I think we, uh, if we had taken one more step towards overthrowing Lukashenko, Putin would have sent troops to uh, Belarus. Uh, and everything uh, was ready for this, uh, for that, and uh, we, uh, there were signs of this. We were uh, 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 troops, Russian troops, moving to Belarus, to the border of Belarus. And instead of today's hybrid occupation, we, uh, we would get a really military occupation of Belarus by Putin. And the second mistake we made, we were left without the support of Belarusians who serve in the security forces. At at that time in August 2020, that was rather possible. But the desire for fair punishment of the rep representative of the security forces who participated in the suppression of the protest pushed the security forces into the arm of uh, Lukashenko. So they don't want to support protesters because they understand if uh, we will win, they will go to the jail. Uh, therefore, the Belarusian society did not have a better scenario, in my point of view, to resist the armed dictator who was supported by Putin. But what had the protests in Belarus achieved? Uh, to my mind, the main achievement was from uh, the point of view of current situation, I mean the war in Ukraine, is that Lukashenko could not send the Belarusian army for death uh, in Ukraine. And this was achieved by the Belarusians who went on process, uh, protests in 2020. And another our achievement is that we stated that Belarusians are a separate nation and not, as Lukashenko said, Russians with a sign of quality. <laughs> that, was, that was our intention. But, uh, intention. That was uh, what was, uh, that we wanted to say. 
the second question, does Belarus exist today? I would divide into two separate questions. What is Belarus like today and will Belarus uh, exist in the future? Uh, there is some opinion that Lukashenko had created a kind of unique and very stable authoritarian regime, but I think it, it is neither stable nor, nor new. Uh, but it is my opinion as an economist, not as a politologist. Uh, it is, uh, if it is so stable, Lukashenko wouldn't ask Putin for help in 2020 and wouldn't continue political repression for more than uh, three years. And the Lukashenko regime is not new. Lukashenko is trying to use the same approach implemented by Hitler. At the beginning of his political career, Lukashenko said not everything was so bad for Hitler. Uh, um, uh, I'm sure you d don't uh, remember this. It was in 1995, but I think uh, he tried to follow this. From his economic system, Lukashenko took the idea of so-called welfare state. Within this model, the state provides citizens with free or subsidized access to certain social services, healthcare, education, etc. And at the, same, uh, at the same time, the authorities in every possible way declare that uh, uh, and emphasize that dependent stat uh, the dependent status, status of the citizens, which without the support of care and state, will not be able, uh, able to provide livelihood for their families. So he tried to, he, uh, 30 years, he told this to Belarusians and uh, supported this passive, not active population who don't want to participate in political life. Uh, government pro propaganda constantly repeats that the citizens underpay for utilities and public transport and receive certain social services for free. This allowed to, cre allow, uh, to create a citizen who is dependent on the state and who does not interfere in politics and had neither the desire nor the ability to influence decision-making in the country and, in fact, realize his or her uh, constitutional rights. A, uh, a continuation of the implementation of such a political, political model is Lukashenko's statement, sometimes there is no time for laws. He said it in 2020 to his security forces, which is very similar to the well-known I free you from the Hamera called conscience. Not the same, but from my point of view, it's something uh, uh, related, I think. And today, Lukashenko has realized repressions in Belarus. Not a single day goes by in Belarus without detaining people for reading independent uh, media, reposting news, putting likes for the news and some other minor things. Another element of Lukashenko's dictatorship regime is the fight against leaders of social movements, opinion leaders and independent media that counter Lukashenko's propaganda. And this pol uh, policy was again formulated by Lukashenko himself. Uh, we pick them out like raisins from a bread. You already know this and have done this many times. This word sounds like, uh, more like the jargon of a crime boss rather than a head of a state. Such a policy has been implemented by Lukashenko throughout the entire period of the existence of uh, the dictatorship regime in Belarus. Uh, these are, to my mind, these are the main elements of the authoritarian system that Lukashenko has been uh, building for all these years. He hasn't come up uh, with anything new or special. What was added new in 2023 is nuclear weapon brought to Belarus and probably located near the field camp of representatives of a terrorist organization, private military company Wagner, controlled by, controlled by Putin's regime. But possibly you know this, that a nuclear weapon is here, Wagner is here, and what can be in several months, nobody knows. What will be then Ukraine try to deoccupy Crimea? The next, the next question, will Belarus exist in the future? And I think the, uh, the answer largely depends on, uh, victory, on Ukraine's victory in the war for its independence. The victory of Ukraine, the fall of Putin's regime's, uh, regime gives uh, Belarus a chance to maintain, maintain it, uh, its independence and get rid of Lukashenko dictatorship. 
I think uh, since 2020, Lukashenko gets uh, get Belarus uh, as sought a lot of this poison dictatorship that I hope so much that we have immunity. Finally, we have immunity. We will not, we will, we will not want that our kids will go away from our country due to this crazy and psychopath and his crew. Uh, how can we make sure that Ukraine wins, uh, the Russian regime loses, and Belarus remain in, uh, remains in existence? Firstly, extended support is needed for Ukraine by democratic world. And it is not the Ukrainian military needs Western weapons. E uh, but Western uh, countries, Western democracies need the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian armed forces to have all the, uh, the necessary weapons to uh, fight Putin. Secondly, it is needed to combat Russian propaganda, not only in democratic countries, but first of all in Russia. The democratic societies cannot lost against Putin a regime and struggle for the main resource of, that fuels Putin's war, Russian people. Without Russian people, without Russian citizens who want to die for the dictator, the war will not continue. And uh, there, I tried to find the answer to the question, do Russians want war? And it is given by Russian society itself. And this is not the answer to the question, do you support the so-called special military operation? This is the number of those Russian peoples who do not want to participate, uh, participate in a such survey. This you can see uh, these numbers. This sounds more. 79 a percent of uh, Russians do not want to participate in this series. Uh, this is, I think, this is the number of those who do not want to, uh, to do not support this war in Russia in reality. And destroying Putin's propaganda will speed up the victory of Ukraine and give Belarus a chance to survive. Uh, and as an economist, I try to make some insight about sanction policy. I think it can be improved. It is not, uh, not working perfectly uh, today. So some, uh, some, some, uh, some uh, opinion from me. It is also necessary to rebuild sanction policy on a long-term basis. New version of sanction policy had to minimize its damage to the countries initiating sanctions in order to continue the support from the society of sanction policy. It was not necessary, necessary to introduce, uh, again, large-scale sanctions, which can damage, damage not only Putin's regime, but also Western economies. Sanctions can be imposed, imposed on small enterprises that allocated within clusters and industries of the Russian military economy and uh, allow to stop these industries and, uh, industries and clusters. But there are two very important rules of, uh, for sanction policy. Sanctions, it is not in way, uh, my innovation, I, but I support it. This is from the researchers who did the research on sanction policy. Uh, there are two very important rules. Sanctions must be implemented immediately and not in month after its approval. And sanctions must be sudden and not announced before implementation which will not give Putin's regime the opportunity to prepare for, for them. To my mind, the toughest, uh, toughest sanctions should be imposed against everyone in Russia who participates in the propaganda of war, everyone who provides human fuel for uh, this uh, war. Propagandists of all levels, artists who support the war, directors and actors who study in propaganda films, etc. Uh, uh, Western society have to fight uh, uh, this propaganda uh, inside Russia. It is, uh, no, uh, it is uh, as important as inside uh, uh, democracies. A new sanctions policy is needed against countries that helps Putin's regime to avoid the, the restrictive measures. Uh, and uh, uh, sanctions against certification and standardization bodies and chambers of commerce in such countries seems to be the most effective. It's my opinion. These bodies and third country are directly involved in the legalization of sanctions trade flows 
and it takes years, not the next day you can create the new uh, body who can uh, overcome the sanctions, but it takes years to create new certification body. And without certification body, especially without Chamber of Commerce, you cannot trade. This will stop the whole trade of this country, third country, which helps Putin. Such sanctions can create critical risk for the economies that help to overcome the sanctions, help to Putin to destroy this international order. I think it is fair punishment for, this, for, for such countries. And the final answer to the question, does Belarus exist today? This is the answer. Belarus exists and continue to exist while Belarusians themselves fight for its existence. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for this uh, very uh, powerful presentation. Um, uh, I know that uh, Kalis and uh, Elisabetta have, have to run and catch a plane. I'm, I'm so sorry that you have to go. So me, before t giving the word to the last speaker, I will just uh, let you run so that not to uh, disturb uh, the presentation. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think the answer to the question, does Belarus exist, is, was also extremely interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Rosa, um, I will, uh, as the last speaker, this is a very, it's a new perspective actually on, uh, on, on, on Belarus because uh, before uh, 2020, uh, Lukashenko had uh, uh, two vector policies. You know, when he, he couldn't get money from, from Russia, he would turn to the EU, let out a few political prisoners, and, and then the EU would be happy and then start cooperation. But uh, now Sugar Mom is away. So is China back or are China there for us? Yes, it's uh, um, um, my uh, presentation. It's a, uh, it's, uh, yes, attempt to uh, uh, answer to your question about China and about uh, second uh, um, vector or maybe second pillar, uh, if we uh, uh, talk about Belarusian, uh, I, I mean state propaganda. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to the conference and the topic uh, of Belarus continues to remain relevant in every sense. And thank you because uh, I'm uh, Rosa Turarbekova, but I'm Belarusian citizen. Uh, I'm from Kazakhstan, but about 25 years I lived in uh, Belarus. And uh, Belarus for me, it's my uh, second motherland. And uh, I uh, participate in protests like uh, activist. Um, and we, um, with my colleagues, found uh, uh, Free, Belarus, uh, uh, Free Belarus Union in Belarusian State University. And for the, for the KGB, it's, um, it's surprised some, but uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, I with my family, uh, we uh, live, uh, live uh, sorry, fled from country. And uh, right now I, I'm independent expert because before that I, I was uh, uh, associated professor on Belarus State University Faculty of International Relations about 24 years. And uh, my uh, topic, it's the second pillar of the foreign policy of Belarus, relations with China. I think it's very interesting because it's maybe it's a part of answer about uh, Belarus's exist or not. Uh, thank you. Uh, political isolation, I sorry, sorry, just a moment. Political isolation of Lukashenko's administration by the EU, USA, Canada, and the UK. Uh, in the aftermath of fabricated presidential election of 2020, violence against peaceful protesters, mass political repressions, creation of migra migration crisis had resulted into strict sanctions enabled by participation of Belarusian regime in attack of Russia on Ukraine. As a result, European and Ukrainian markets closed for Belarusian exports, and levels of political and diplomatic relations dropped to extremely low levels. 
Павел Мацукевич and Регор, and Регор Остапени, it's a Belarusian experts, have labeled this process as degradation of foreign policy. Traditionally, the European vector in uh, Belarusian foreign policy played a secondary role, albeit in terms of trade and other forms of economic cooperation. In these conditions, uh, Russian vector has become defining uh, for foreign policy and economic activity of the Republic of Belarus. In response to slowing Russian aggression in Ukraine and its abandon uh, of the front lines, Belarusian government has worked ever more intense on Chinese vector. Uh, according to Lukashenko, China would compensate all losses of Belarusian economy resulted from war and sanctions. A uh, Belarusian government's political discourse makes an impression that China is a second pillar of foreign policy and trade, which repays loss of Western markets and cooperation with Europe as a whole. Although, uh, considering approximate assessment of losses in European vector and mediocre rise in trade with China, the picture is rather controversial. As Yeliseev and Alyeshka Lesel and other uh, it's, uh, uh, Belarusian experts note, imagine between expectations of Minsk about economic profit from cooperation with China and real state of things. And this question is main of, the, of this uh, topic. Is Lukashenko's administration really managed to replace Europe for China in foreign policy? Would China become a counterbalancer Russia in Belarusian foreign policy? Even before 2020, the Belarusian government was interested in intensifying cooperation with China. In turn, Beijing counted on the advantageous geographical position of Belarus as a bridge between Eurasia and Europe. In this regard, the Chinese government assigned a certain role to Belarus as a logistic, logistics and possibly industrial Chinese hub at the gates of Europe. The most exemplary uh, case was the investment in the Great Stone Industrial Park. However, as an expert survey showed, already since 2017, there has been a discrepancy in the assessment of the uh, purpose of the Great Stone. Chinese experts perceived it just as a logistic hubs, logistics hub, Belarusian ones as a higher tech one. At the same time, negative assessments were noted regarding the shortage of market elements in organizing investment cooperation. Therefore, discrepancies between the high level of political cooperation and problems in the economic sphere were noted even before the 2020 crisis. The problem perception is a key problem in Belarusian-Chinese uh, relations. An analysis of expert assessments in 2020 showed that at the core of the the, there is a problem of perception. It consists of the following elements. First, the gap between expected and achieved results, a syn synchronous uh, development of political and economic cooperation. Uh, second, sorry, first, 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 sorry, uh, that's my mistake. Conf conflict of interest using the example of the Great Stone Industrial Park. In particular, the difference in the approach of the Belarusian and Chinese sides. Uh, uh, three, uh, third, the idea of, Bel of the Belarusian leadership Lukashenko in the first place is about the Chinese model as a socialist model, planet economic management of the Soviet type. While Chinese experts called Belarusian managers and bureaucrats Soviet-like in, in, in a negative uh, connotation. After some polls, uh, which lasted from the winter of 2020 to autumn of 2022, high-level contacts between the Belarusian and Chinese sides resumed. On July 15, uh, 2022, uh, Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization Secretary General, uh, General uh, Chan Min announced that Belarus had uh, su submitted an application to join the organization. On September 15 to 16, 2022, Lukashenko was invited to the uh, SCO summit in Samarkand, where the official application process was launched. This summit also saw a meeting between Lukashenko and Xi Jinping, where the creation of comprehensive strategic partnership was announced. 
This officially confirmed Beijing's support for Minsk at the highest level. It should be noted that airstrikes on Ukraine from Belarusian territory almost stopped in the autumn of 2022, which contributed to the differentiated approach of the European Union to sanctions against Minsk. I mean, new packages of sanctions were not adopted, unlike Moscow. For Beijing, this could also be a sign to intensify contacts. From February 28 to March uh, 2, 2023, Lukashenko made an official state visit to China and was again personally received by Chinese Xi. The world media paid close attention to this event in the context of China's peace plan for Ukraine, as well as in connection with suspicions that Beijing may be involved in possible supplies of sanctioned dual-use goods and even weapons, and Belarus may be a logistics channel for them. According to official sources, 27 intergovernmental, interdepartmental and interregional agreements and eight major trade agreements were signed. Particular attention was paid to industrial cooperation and e-commerce. The most important documents signed during the visit was the joint statement on promoting an all-weather and comprehensive strategic partnership between the two countries in a new uh, era. Sorry, but it's the name of this document. <laughs> <laughs> in it, uh, both uh, sides oppose sanctions, support Chinese peace plan for Ukraine, highlight key areas of cooperation and agree to open a fifth general consulate in Hong Kong. As expected, government propaganda on both sides extolled this, uh, the visit and its results, but critical questions remain. Starting from 2020, the text of the free trade agreement with China is being prepared. It was previously noted that uh, in the face of growing pressure from Russia in 2020, the Lukashenko administration accelerated work on it in order to balance ties with Moscow and Beijing. However, the COVID-19 uh, factor and the political crisis in Belarus slowed it down. Process was resumed in 2022-2023. In particular, the joint statement noted that the basis for a joint free trade agreement was already existing. But the specifics uh, of the context of the international situation of Belarus have changed drastically. In addition to political isolation, war and sanctions, the process of implementing road maps of the Union state, which is equal to a soft absorption of Belarus by Russia, had begun uh, to, pay, uh, to play a greater role. Road maps of the Union state have become um, tools for slow and soft absorption of Belarus by Russia. It's working in uh, critically important areas, areas of the government administration and authority, taxes, customs, roads, etc. Therefore, given the obligations of conflicts between obliga obligations to Russia and China, this will most likely result in uh, a delay or in, signing, in the signing of the agreement. The decisive uh, moment will be the approval of an agreement with union programs, I mean roadmaps with Russia. On the frequently used plot, line, plot lines of Belarusian propaganda is the demonstration of success in trade with China. But if we, if we consider details of the information on trade turnover uh, for 2022, there are a number of points that make the picture quite confusing. Since, de since detailed foreign trade uh, statistics are not available, uh, it is difficult to work with any of the 2022 data. There are indirect, indirect signs of serious losses of Belarusian exports as a whole. According to, to the official statement of representatives of the Minister of Economy, China was the second largest foreign trade partner in 2022. Considering that by, that by 2020, China was only the third importer, but was not one of the three largest foreign trade partners of Belarus. One can guess how much exports have decreased. 
trade growth in bilateral relations appears to have been moderate as a figure of 5.8 uh, billion was billion dollars I mean was also cited for the 2021 uh, result there was no breakthrough uh, in exports to China. Today, we cannot say that China was able to replace the EU as a trading partner in Belarusian exports. The rhetoric about all weather and comprehensive strategic partnerships also needs critical reflection uh, in light of Putin's statements about the deployment of technical nuclear weapons on Belarusian territory. Considering China's anti-nuclear position in the dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction ex expressed by Beijing regarding these plans, we can conclude for Minsk relations with Russia are so significant that even criticism of Beijing cannot stop the process of deploying to, uh, tactical, uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. It's my finish. Thank you so much. I think uh, uh, we have over exceeded our time, uh, tw uh, 20 minutes, and I really apologize for this, uh, for to, to the participants. Um, I um, still would think that um, we might have one question, allow one question before, uh, if there is anybody who is uh, has the energy for that. Otherwise, I'd like to say uh, thank you to the panelists. Thank you for your presentations. And remember, there will be actually a um, booklet coming out very soon that in which you can actually read many of the, the, the presentations coming out. It's just, I think, it'll, it's actually out tomorrow. Uh, but um, these are some of the articles individually here that you can read. Um, and we will, in the Belarus Research uh, neighborhood for the European neighborhood continue to have a focus on, on Belarus and I think it's not only important even though I, I have been many times to Belarus and uh, I know how important Belarus is and close to my heart it's also important for Europe as such it's important for the Baltic region as, as we heard it's important in terms of the rules based world order as, uh, as um, uh, Sergei told us it's important in terms of fighting democracy and fighting for democracy and the, the world that we are living in, as Pavel pointed out, and the way that dictatorships actually form themselves today and how we denominate dictatorships. Uh, because I heard the same discussions, whether it's a kind of, is it a dictator, it's not fascism, but actually there is a famous book by Guriev, it's called Spin Dictatorships, and this is actually what we're seeing at the moment. And the fight against internal propaganda in Russia and, and how we actually secure that the Russian population does not feed the war as it is today. And then, of course, we have the luring factor out there. And I think you made the point that actually China is not, is not replacing EU in, 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 uh, in Belarus uh, foreign policy, actually, as it stands today. And... Um, and they have an, maybe another aim as just a logistical hub, which is important. And then, of course, there's the whole cultural element, which I think is, is crucial that we, especially in foreign policy, start to understand what does culture actually mean in foreign and security policy. Um, so if this sort of rounds things up, I hope it does, I think we need to give all of us a, a great hand not only the panelists, but everybody here. So, and thank you.